Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Um, we're just uh, waiting a few more minutes. One of our panelists had a uh, presentation before the Nevada Gaming Control Board and uh, just finished his agenda item. And uh, so we may just wait just a couple of minutes, one, to allow people to log in and second, um, to, uh, uh, to, to allow Mark Liparelli to join us. As you're aware, the, uh, the topic we're going to cover today is emerging technology and its impact on regulatory policy. And I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about our panelists uh, while we're waiting for the attendees to uh, queue up here. Um, very pleased to be moderating this uh, um, with such a great group of panelists. We have a representative from academia in Tony Cabot, who is a distinguished professor of law at the Boyd School of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and also had a lengthy and very successful career as a private uh, lawyer in private practice for many years. Um, also joining us uh, representing the regulators is Marcus Fripter, the administrator of the Illinois Gaming Board. Um, Marcus has been in that position for what, about a little over a year now? I think you might be muted. You are. That's my first uh, webinar faux pas of the day, um, hopefully yeah. the last. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, since May of 2019, so a, a bit over a year. This came up on your year anniversary, and prior to that, he, he served in the uh, SEC cyber unit, and so is in, in uh, a unique position to be able to discuss this. And soon we will be joined by Mark Liparelli, um, who not only has uh, a lengthy and, and diverse career uh, on the industry side, but I think maybe in, a, in the unique club of not only been an industry executive for several major gaming companies, um, but has also uh, served as a regulator, being the chair of the Nevada Gaming Control Board, and also served in the Nevada State Senate. So I don't, I don't know, Tony, you go back even further than I do. Do you know anybody who's been a legislator, a regulator, and an industry executive? Uh, I do not think so. I think Mark's unique. Yeah. Mark, we're trying to decide if you're in a club of one. <laughs> um, so as Mark joins us, um, um, why don't we get into our... Uh, to our presentation and and really the the first topic in uh is um, the, the the type of technology that's available to us today and the ability to to uh know things about consumers and their behaviors is has grown to a point that um even even in the consumer electronics industry or the the normal retail industry um, we're st they're starting to see the need to regulate themselves. Um, we're about a year, year and a half uh, away from what we know is cookies going away, tracking cookies, because there's been such pushback from privacy, privacy experts, consumers, and the legal community about the invasiveness of the way that we track people now. Um, some of this technology is just now making its way into the gaming industry, uh, much because uh, the, the heavily regulated nature of it, <laughs> regulatory structures are somewhat um, intolerant of negative impacts that, uh, that affect consumers. Um, so, Mark, why don't we lead off? Well, and the, the other thing is that some of these technologies have been called into question just in their normal use outside of the uh, gaming industry. Uh, Clearview, which is a an organization that uh, provides technology to the police departments um, ran into, has run into a lot of controversy with regard to the use of their biometric tools and the ways they said they were using it versus the ways they were actually using it. And um, so in Google um, has announced their sandbox initiative, which is set up to try to control the next wave of how we track consumers and their behavior uh, in the information economy. Um, and before I turn it over to Mark, I thought there's a couple of helpful resources uh, for those of you interested in this area of the law. Um, 
One of them is Biometric Surveillance in the Law. It's a, it's a treatise. It, look, it sounds like it should be a 600-page book, but it's actually about uh, a 300-page book that is very concise um, and relatively easy to read treatise on, um, on this area, on biometric and, and consumer surveillance. And then another book that I think is a very easy read, it's called Possible Minds, uh, and it's 25 separate essays from the world's leading minds in artificial intelligence. And they come at, at it from a broad uh, uh, array of perspectives. Um, uh, that you have people that uh, think that technology should be unconstrained by any regulatory efforts and just let uh, the, uh, the, the economy drive and consumer preference drive the way it goes. And then you have others that think that it should be heavily regulated. But I think it's a very good uh, way to quickly educate yourself on the technology that's available and the legal and ethical issues that are involved in the deployment of this technology. Um, so with that, Mark, I think, uh, Mark Lipparelli, uh, I think you're in uh, a very good position to talk about the ways that the gaming industry has started to use some of these technologies from data collection to biometrics to artificial intelligence. Um, can, you, can you discuss some of the ways that um, operators are looking to implement this and some of the solutions suppliers are, have, uh, are, are investigating? Sure. Um, first off, can you hear me okay on the line? I, I was a late arrival. I just want to make sure that the voice is coming across good. Yeah, your audio is good. Great, great. Well, thanks, um, Kevin. I, I think it's a a really interesting topic. We, we've discussed this before that the industry is really reshaping. Um, the gaming industry, when it started its loyalty programs, um, essentially you know, broke into the marketplace of, of getting customers to, to give up personal information, um, primarily in exchange for the value of having um, the opportunity for redemption of, of player points. Now we've transcended that with mobile gaming as essentially part of a pre-approval process to, to be able to join in you know, a casino project or a mobile casino project. And as a result of that, you know, third-party services, I acquired a company last year called CAMS, and that's essentially what we do. We're proving out that people are who they say they are. And it kind of runs counter to the history of, of what's been happening in the the brick and mortar world where people can walk into a casino and essentially be anonymized. I think there's some, you know, skepticism about how anonymous those players are, but now given that it's a mandate, um, many questions are being raised as to, you know, how those, how those pieces of information are being verified and who owns that information and how is it being managed among, you know, a group of technology companies that by their nature are required to integrate with each other. Um, so where are the responsibilities? Where are the legal liabilities? Um, so everything from, you know, your personal identification numbers to your picture, to your address, to, you know, all the things that people would hold dear um, in order to participate in online gaming is really creating, you know, some leading, leading questions and leading thoughts around, you know, how to treat customers. And it transcends into other industries that are now also facing that same question. Um, so... I'll start with that as an opener, but um, we can go through some Q&A and we can expound on that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, biometric technology and, and, and how they're looking to use that? Um, you know, before we had the, the player tracking systems and in the online world, of course, we, we always know who the customer is and what they're doing. Um, biometrics has allowed, um, allowed for the capability to be able to identify somebody who is really intending on being anonymous and what are some of the practical and, and regulatory and, and, and ethical issues involved with that? Yeah, um, so biometrics becomes a, a pretty important component of confidentiality and, and we're really into the second and third generations of the use of, of biometrics. Um, I think everyone recognizes that you know, people can use their thumbprint on on devices now, but I think where that's leading, the ones that I'm evaluating, the ones that make the most sense for CAMs, are ones that create and use things like blockchain 
to keep that information um, you know, safe from, from prying eyes. Um, it also has the benefit of once a customer has been identified, it could actually be utilized to expedite you know, the sign-on process, the login process. And there's some really good advancements being made that will shield someone from you know, having their pictures revealed and stored on servers and connected to critical personal information where I think uh, the challenge will be is in, in getting regulators comfortable that that is an appropriate mechanism to go through an identification process, a certification process. But clearly that's where I see things leading. Um, I know some of these changes have actually been or in the process of being implemented um, in things like travel, what you see in airports, um, for the very same reasons, you know, high level of accuracy, high level of success, but at the same time, high level of security. And Mark, uh, just one more follow-up. You know, one of the tenets of good regulation is to have an informed consumer. What are some of the considerations that operators and, and, and suppliers should make when trying to explain this technology to consumers? Yeah, I, I think it falls into that bucket of what we all experience in, in being avid users of, of mobile devices, especially now in the middle of COVID. You know, it seems like almost all of our transactions are moving more and more towards mobile. Um, I, I think disclosures are super important. Um, I've been writing some of those myself and reviewing others um, where I think you have to be honest and upfront with, with uh, customers as to how their personal information is gonna be utilized and, and where it might be utilized. Um, the good news is I think you know, the gaming industry, again, has set itself apart for many, many years to, you know, to being mindful of those requirements and have a, you know, a, obviously a vigorous regulatory process looking over everyone's shoulder. I don't think the same thing applies for the non-gambling um, world where you have a lot of retail environments that don't have the equivalent of a, of a, of a gaming control board or gaming commission making sure that if something goes awry with someone's personal information that there's an ability to hold them accountable. I know there's some federal level um, protections against those kinds of mishaps, but um, closure is the best medicine, you know, when people sign on and having those reminders come through, probably not less than once a year that, you know, your information is being collected and stored and being used in the following ways. I think that that kind of social contract with those customers is critically important. Uh, Marcus, uh, a lot of the eyes from the industry are on Illinois uh, because for reasons that appear to be unrelated to gaming, and a number of years ago, the legislature passed some very strict laws protecting personal data of consumers and particularly in the area of biometrics. Um, recently, that's resulted in a wave of litigation, some of it involving some gaming companies. Um, can you uh, tell us uh, the current status of uh, that litigation, where you think it's heading, and, and uh, whether the law will remain the same, or, or whether this is a, going to be a bit of a moving target because of the sheer volume of the cases that have been filed, uh, some involving gaming companies, but many not? Sure, and, uh, and thanks again for having me on. And just before I, I get into that, I've got to give the required disclaimer so that the views I expressed today and my answers and thoughts are, are my own. They don't represent the views of the Illinois Gaming Board or the state of Illinois. So uh, with that out of the way, um, before I get to the, your question with respect to litigation, I want to provide a very quick overview of the Illinois law that you mentioned, and that's the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, and it's 740 ILCS. 14-1-XSEC. Uh, and we've got it here in the material, so I'm not going to go through all of it, but you're exactly right. It was enacted uh, 2008, um, kind of a prescient piece of legislation that the General Assembly passed back then. And it was passed in part because biometrics were becoming to be popular or there was an anticipation that they were going to play more of a role in a lot of financial transactions and other kinds of consumer transactions. And there was the concern that Chicago was going to be one of the pilot centers for that technology to roll out. So the legislature passed this act, as I said, in 2008, and it still remains, I think, among the most protective in the country of personal biometric information. So among other things, 
the Act defines what biometric information is. Again, that's in, in the materials. And the key salient points of it are a few. First, it governs what private companies, how they can collect, capture, purchase, receive, or otherwise obtain biometric identifiers or biometric information. And it requires that before a private entity can do any of those things, it's got to inform the customer or the patron or the person whose data is being collected that, in fact, the information is being collected and or stored. They've also got to inform the patron that it is that in writing, again, of the specific purpose and duration that the information is being collected, stored, and used. And then finally, you've got to obtain written consent or a written release. Um, so that, you can imagine, presents a number of different challenges, not just for folks in the gaming industry, but for people in many different kinds of industries. The reason I think that there has been litigation, and, and you're correct, Kevin, at all of the Illinois casinos um, have been sued, and those lawsuits are in various stages, and, and I'll get to that in a moment. But I think one of the reasons why there's been so much litigation, um, first, because this is a very important information, I think that I would agree that we need to have strong safeguards around how biometric information is collected, how biometric information is used, and to echo Mark's point that informed disclosure is very central to those, to those activities. The, the reason, I think, for much of the litigation is because the law provides for liquidated damages, and it provides $1,000 damages when there's negligent misuse or a violation of the law, and up to $5,000 when there is a reckless violation of the law. And in a court case, um, the Illinois Supreme Court ruled in 2019 that you don't have to have an actual injury to have standing to bring a lawsuit. So that, put in other words, your injury is the fact that the rights that the law was intended to protect were violated by a, by a, by a violation of the law. Um, and that was a case brought by, against Six Flags. Uh, for any of you who have been in Illinois or Southern Wisconsin, at the Great America theme park, and that involved the use of biometric information in connection with seasoned pass holders. Um, so the litigation that has been brought against the Illinois casinos allege in varying different degrees that these companies have used their surveillance systems and through those surveillance systems make use of facial recognition software in connection in some respects with their rewards clubs programs to create a database or otherwise track um, their patrons. Now each of these cases make somewhat different kinds of allegations and none of them have moved through to the summary judgment or even to the trial stage. So I think there's a lot of uh, litigation focusing on right now. There, some of them were brought in state court. They've been removed to federal court. So there's litigation and there's, tri there's motion practice, bringing those back and forth between the two. And then there's other stations where they're preparing either a motion to dismiss or other kinds of procedural stuff. So the bottom line is we don't yet have a sense of where the courts are heading with respect to biometric information and the casinos. I think that some of the discovery and as we get into more substantial motion practice and evidence gathering will involve whether in fact each of these gaming companies use the information or use the technology that they're alleged to have used in the lawsuit. Um, so that, that's kind of where those are. That's mostly about what I can say with respect to litigation and what's publicly available. I think that there is a lot of litigation over this, over this act that goes well beyond the gaming context. And I think that will continue to evolve, and I think we're going to get some additional court opinions that will add some context and texture and provide some guidance as to where this is headed. It remains to be seen whether those will be within the gaming context or in other industries that have been sued. Um, but, you know, it's, as far as I think you asked if it's a, a moving target, I think that when we last had this discussion uh, pre-COVID, these were issues were top of mind for many people. I think since that time, COVID has, has among other things, exacerbated people's concerns and trust about how, what is the government doing? What are private entities doing? How are these things being collected? Why are they doing it? So I think that as this continues to progress and we have to rely on more contact tracing, surveillance, these issues involving biometric information get pretty close to where we are right now. So I think the, the, the short answer uh, to the long part of my statement is I think a lot of this remains to be seen. A lot of it is still up in the air. But I, I don't see Illinois going backwards. So when the Illinois had a large uh, uh, gaming expansion bill recently, they've, they've had 
couple of attempts to go back and revisit that. Um, there's some rumor that they could try to revisit it again in 2021. Uh, was this topic uh, uh, part of any of those discussions? Nothing that, I, that I'm aware of or that I've participated in. Um, I think that this law is on the books. I'm not aware of any, act, of any efforts to you know, expand it or retract it. So I think that this, is, this was not something that I was involved in discussing or, or an issue that, that really reached any kind of critical mass in the press or elsewhere. I do want to make one thing as I look at uh, the notes up there that I neglected to mention a moment ago. A huge part of it um, under the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act was a settlement that Facebook entered um, earlier this year, I think in January or February, and that was for $550 million in a class action lawsuit. Um, and that was just for Illinois alone, and that's the amount of money that Facebook paid out uh, for alleged violations of the act. Um, so you can imagine what their own internal litig litigation risk analysis said the potential exposure was if they didn't settle. And Marcus, you know, as you mentioned, Illinois had the, the presence to deal with this in 2008. They're one of just a handful of states that have uh, laws in this area. Most states are still uh, trying to work through the policy process to decide their position on this issue. Um, for those states that, 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 that haven't defined or set parameters in this regard, uh, what things do you think they should consider uh, is the gaming industry, uh, uh, should it be treated differently than the rest of the, the economy or should the rules be the same for everyone? Um, so I'm, as a regulator, I'm loath to give advice to uh, the General Assembly in my own state. So I, I certainly want to be careful about giving advice to, to policymakers in other states. But I think um, in all seriousness, I think the keys to effective regulation are you have to have an explanation of why the data is being collected, how's it going to be used, how's it going to be stored, and there's got to be a strong disclosure and, and some kind of a consent requirement. So that's, I think, the first pillar. The second pillar is the rules need to be clear and consistent, both so that the companies can understand them, in our case, the gaming industry can understand them, the patrons can understand what is happening and how they can make a decision whether or not to opt in or opt out. And then third, the regulations and the statute need to be clear so that the regulators can understand them and can enforce them and apply them in a consistent, transparent, um, and accountable manner. I think those are the keys to any sound policy. Um, we're lucky or unique, depending on one's perspective in the gaming industry that, as Mark said earlier, and you also mentioned, Kevin, it is so highly regulated that we're used to working very closely with our licensees on a number of different things. And so I think the implementation is easier for us. And we can kind of begin as, as biometrics and use of facial recognition technology emerge in gaming. We have an opportunity to kind of do it the right way and avoid some of the abuses or avoid some of the problems that, Kevin, you highlighted in your opening remarks. Tony, uh, the Boyd School of Law has taken a leadership role in this issue, particularly as it relates to the gaming industry. Uh, I was very uh, pleased to be a part of the, the day-long CLE event that you hosted uh, in January, and that work is continuing. So can you talk a little bit about the Boyd Initiative and, and put this, uh, uh, this, this issue in, in perspective from, uh, from how lawyers are looking at it, how the industry is looking at it, and how it fits into the rest of the economy. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I'll be happy to do that. So uh, at the last G2E, um, one of the things that, that struck me and a number of other people was the significant amount of, of biometrics and uh, artificial intelligence that different companies were, were uh, displaying in, in some in beta stages, some ready for the marketplace. And a lot of it was you know, things like that Mark talked about with regard to the ability to utilize biometrics um, as, a, as a methodology to access your accounts. But at the same time, a lot of it was um, much more progressed than that. And you, know, you, you could see the potential where a person on a, who walks into a casino on an anonymous basis 
uh, is picked up by um, facial recognition. Um, there's cameras that are uh, ubiquitous throughout the casino, so they know exactly where that person goes. That person can then sit down and start playing a machine. They can start recording his play or her play on that machine. They can tell who he or she is playing with. They can, they can match that up to um, um, the slot maintenance system and, and know exactly how much they're playing, what games they're playing, what they like. And if we take it one step further, when we talked about Clearview, you could then go ahead and actually identify the person. So all of a sudden, a person who thought they were walking in playing on an anonymous basis has this massive database about who they are, who they're with, what they're doing, how much they spent, what their play habits are, and things of that nature. And so when we looked at that, um, we decided that you know, this is going to be a, an issue, as, as Marcus has been talking about, that is of public importance. And, and the question becomes is, well, do you handle it as a, a matter of public policy at a high level like Illinois did with their statute? And how much of this then is, is left to the regulators to decide through regulation? And we started looking at, at the, um, the potential regulatory implications. So if it's not covered, uh, on the state level by state law or federal level by federal law. Um, what can regulators do? And this is a chart I use in my class, um, which, which I think leads to, you know, effective regulation. And it's obviously to know what your policy goals are. You create laws in consistency with that policy goals. You have to have a regulatory structure. You create the regulations, you implement it. And then you always are going back evaluating and optimizing it. And so every state in every jurisdiction is going to have slightly different policy goals, policy determinations. They're going to have different regulatory infrastructures. But we're, what we're trying to do in our conference in, in January, which was hopefully going to be followed up by smaller conferences throughout the year until a bigger issue came along called the pandemic, which kind of sidetracked our, our efforts, but we'll, we'll get back to it, is, is to try to give some nuance to how this impacts the gaming industry in particular, if it gets down to that regulatory level. So when I look at this, I, you know, I look at, at, at the use of AI and biometrics in the casino industry in four major areas. Um, and when I look at these areas, I'm looking at them from a risk perspective, as well as um, an expectation of privacy uh, perspective. You know, in, in what context do the customers expect to have some level of privacy? And how do we balance that against what we're trying to accomplish by implementing the regulations? So we can, we can cycle past this, we can cycle past the next slide. Um, cause I want to get to the, the actual territories. So, so this is government benefits. Here we go. Rest of what could go wrong. What's the likelihood it could go wrong? What are the consequences? So with the first area is security, right? And security, I think the risks are pretty evident. You know, we look at what happened on October 1st, 2017 in Las Vegas and human lives are at stake, right? We have, domestic terrorists, we have people with mental issues, we have international terrorists, and people go to the casinos, they want to be secure. And they re recognize, I think, that there's going to be uses of biometrics, particularly facial recognition, but also artificial intelligence that are going to keep them safe. And I think they're okay with that, right? Uh, I think they're, they're used to this this presence in the casinos, the eyes in the skies, knowing that they can be surveilled virtually any place on the casino premises, and that they're using that information to keep them safe. So I think that area is one area we look at. The second area is surveillance from the perspective of, of um, casino losses through theft. And once again, the expectation of privacy by the patrons is, I think, relatively low, 
because of the historical um, interference that they've had in the casino experience through surveillance. I mean, there was a catwalks at one point, the catwalks then went to the eyes in the sky, and the eyes in the sky are now being supplemented by uh, you know, improved databases and, and artificial intelligence. But it's always been there, and I think that the players' expectations of privacy are, are not that particularly high. Um, the third area is responsible gambling. And then the fourth area is marketing. And these are the two, I think, newer areas uh, that I think we need to think about. And responsible gambling, you know, obviously to, we, we can do it to identify underage people. We can do a, a facial recognition against self-exclusion list. Um, we can use it to enforce or, or uh, time or play restrictions. Um, we're seeing a, a movement now to try to disclose problem gambling patterns. Um, so I think, you know, some of it's easy. Underage is easy. Self-exclusion, I think, is probably pretty easy. But how do people feel and how do policymakers feel about, oh, we're going to start taking um, biometrics from you, not only your facial recognitions, but your play habits and other things and making an analysis of whether or not we need to have intervention into your play, right? And an issue of this, you know, just recently came up in Nevada, whether or not, you know, payment forms, forms of payments have to, for example, go through a registered system. So if you want to use a debit card or a credit card at a slot machine, do you have to register for the, the slot club before you can do that so that this casinos can track you as you're playing? Um, and, and I think that gets into a lot, I think a lot foggier areas as to whether it's, it's a, a proper invasion of the patron's privacy rights or not to achieve that particular purpose. Then the final area is that marketing area. And, and the marketing area is one where they, you know, they, they can now effectively, if they wanted to, pick you up as you walk into the casino, identify you, then track all your play, even though you thought you were doing it on an anonymous basis with cash. So I think, you know, we have questions like, do we want to limit this or not? Uh, as Mark has mentioned, is it, is it um, opt-in or are we allowed to use some information before the patron opts in? You know, are, are, can we use that information like, for example, a, um, a casino host would have done with his eyes to say, oh, there's a new somebody I don't recognize. Oh, that person seems to be a good player. Maybe I'll approach him to see if I can get him to opt in to our, to our players club. Maybe I can get him to become a good customer. Is there a cutoff at which you can't use that point anymore? Right? Well, Tony, I think it is another issue the ability to take, for instance, a piece of data, let's say like biometric data, and where that, that data is to a certain degree, I don't know, it's fair to say it's in the public domain, but other people have it. Facebook already has your biometric data, whether you're on Facebook or not, because even if you're not on Facebook, and your nephew or your best friend took your picture and identified you as them, and they could tell from your phone that you were with them when they took the picture, they know it's you. So they don't know it's Tony Cabot, but they know you're E95F7, right? And then they can take the other data they have about E95F7 that they've collected from other sources and make a lot of conclusions, right? But the businesses are already doing that. And I guess, what are the issues in applying that in a gaming context? Well, the, and, and I think that's a great point, Kevin, because the, the question becomes is, I, I may be quite happy to share my, my face uh, on Facebook with my friends. Um, I may or may not be thrilled with them or anybody knowing my gambling habits, right? Or who my friends are when I go to gamble or how often I go to, to, to Las Vegas to gamble, 
um, and now how big of a player I am. Those are real questions I think that the industry is going to have to answer on people who don't opt in to the system. You know, most people will opt in. They'll join the loyalty club. They're thrilled that the casino has all this data because they get all these benefits from it. It's how do we treat the people who haven't opt in? A great example, if I may jump in, Tony, yeah. I, for, those of, for those of you who have, have season tickets with either major college sports or pro sports, you now find yourself not carrying around paper tickets anymore, and you also now have the ability to transfer your tickets to a third party. Well, that has become an enormous marketing tool for all the leagues, because every time you transfer your ticket to whoever that person that's going to occupy your seat at that stadium or, or arena, They've now collected, you know, a lot of information for the average customer who thinks they're just getting a ticket. Um, and this is playing itself out in all kinds of interesting ways with regard to who has names and email addresses and pictures. And so, I, Kevin, I think your, your point is a good one. And Tony's hitting on, you know, did I opt in right there? Am I, because I took a Golden Knights ticket, um, am I now, have I now opted in to the Golden Knights marketing program? So it's a great, great thing to think about. Well, and, and that brings up the fundamental question that I think a lot of states are struggling with. What is the appropriate standard? Is it opt-in or opt-out? And, and, and it may, Kevin, it may be a little bit of both, right? I mean, maybe we, we say the people who opt-in, that's great. Enjoy the system. We're going to have all these features for it. But if you didn't opt-in, at what point can the casino record your play or record your presence for the purposes of making an introduction on an anonymous basis. And then if you decide to not opt in, then they have to basically erase that information. Or is it un, is it unbrailed? Can, can, they, can they do anything they want in the context of uh, activities that occur within the casino um, as long as it doesn't violate state law, for example, or federal law? And, and I think there's got to be a limit where you, I don't think there's a point where you can opt out of everything because you can't opt out of everything now. For instance, in every casino that I'm aware of, you are required to be able, have the ability to present a photo identification. Right. So if someone wants to go up and ID you to find out, you know, um, are you of proper age? Are you on our exclusion list? Um, uh, are, are you, you know, it, just if I need to be able to, if I suspect you of some type of behavior and I want to uh, check with local police uh, or check with our gaming agents to see if we have any records of you cheating or doing any or money laundering or doing any other type of activity that it's appropriate to monitor. So you can't opt out of everything now. And I guess therein lies the issue is what can you opt out of? Correct. And, and that's why I think, it, you know, I try to break down into those four categories because I think those four categories have fundamentally different public policy reasons behind them. And we can't make a rule, opt in, opt out, that applies across all four categories. You know, we're gonna have to make a rule saying, now in the world of security, you're gonna have more latitude than what you can do. In the world of, of surveillance, you can have more latitude than what you can do. Now we start getting to responsible gambling and marketing, I think the player considerations start to come more into play and that we have to be more cognizant of a lot of things, you know, including um, patron uh, privacy, patron expectations, um, you know, general public policy issues of that nature. Yeah. If I could jump in, I, I think that's exactly right. And from a policymaker or regulator perspective, on the one hand, I, I think at the outset, you have to identify what goals are we advancing and how do those goals match up with the privacy expectations and the needs of the uh, casino, the needs of the state for security purposes, or the needs to control that, uh, that data and use that data. And then the second part of it, I think, is if you're going to go with an opt-in, you've got to be clear about, as Tony and, and Kevin, you point out, what you're able to opt into and what you're able to opt out of. And I, I think at least 
at this level, at the 50,000 foot level, the sliding scale makes sense, perhaps, um, but you can't have an opt-in that is coercive. So to the extent that you decide not to opt in, you're really left with nothing and, and it's a elusive or a meaningless choice. And then finally, once you've set that structure up about what we're going to allow, how disclosure, how consent is going to be worked out and what are the permitted uses, one thing is really important is you've got to have systems in place so that you can enforce and police to make sure that people are doing with the data what they said they're going to do with the data. Um, in my private, in my prior experience in private practice and at the SEC, that was always a concern. Once someone discloses to their investors that they're going to be doing a certain thing in their uh, in their brokerage practices or in their uh, dark pool for trading purposes or how they're going to be handling your fees, a huge problem is the disclosures are fine and that those comport with the law. But what's really happening, and that can cause, cause a lot of problems, and I think it causes especially big problems when the, the, the misuse involves this biometric data, which is immutable and can't be changed. Thanks, Marcus. That's uh, actually a great lead in to a question we have. And uh, first, I want to give a shout out to the North American Gaming Regulators Association, who requested us to put on this topic and uh, is working with us in, uh, in promoting it. Um, NAGRA has been a great partner of ours over the years and, and we really appreciate their support. So I have a question from one of their members, which is, uh, is there a different uh, uh, expectation of privacy uh, between the online player and, and the live casino player? I mean, I mean, we know in the online world, I, I think most consumers understand that every aspect of their behavior is being tracked because there's a lot it goes into the registration process and there's a lot of maintenance that needs to be done online, but uh, that, that's not the case with the, uh, with the land-based customer who in most cases just knows that they have to show their ID if they, if they need to and, and that they're probably under surveillance. Well, on that, I, I think from a practical standpoint, you know, obviously with online, we as an industry made the de decision to, to mandate identification. You know, clearly there are many who believe that, you know, they can anonymously play in a brick and mortar facility. Um, generally speaking, that's probably true, but at any level of material play, chances are that physical brick and mortar property is gonna do their level best to identify that customer. So practically speaking, um, you know they're gonna they're gonna go out of their way to try to collect information right up against some of those kind of federal boundaries about CTRs and suspicious activity but um, I think those are becoming I think Marcus's point was a perfect one which is practically speaking now some of these commercial offerings um, I use the example of getting a ticket to a to a professional sports event now um, you really don't have an alternative because the only way to get the ticket is to opt in. Um, you, you can't actually enter the building. So I think that's a, Marcus brings up a perfect question, which is practically speaking, can you even enjoy the benefits of one of these businesses without giving up your personal information or are you essentially barred from, from access? So um, I think the, the brick and mortar folks, you know, do a pretty good job to identify their customers, but you probably have some level like of, expectation of privacy if you're you know a low level gambler and you're you're visiting and, and don't want to join a loyalty club but chances are the property knows you're there and that we we actually just had a question another question from a panel or from a member of the audience can a casino can the casino write a disclaimer across all areas allowing for data to be used in aml tracking and investigations or even general liability claim issues thus not allowing it an opt-out by the patron, which I think is the point you're trying to get to, Mark. Yeah, well, with respect to mobile, um, there's it's a black or white consideration. The, the, the operator has the obligation to identify the customer that's signing up and go through that process of identifying anyone with um, a, a, a challenge or a suspicious background or something that would lead them to want to do another level of review the same is not true in a brick and mortar environment up to a certain point. Um, if you know, again, if you're a large scale wager, you're going to go through 
and have an AML check probably done on you as well um, at a certain level of play. Um, but I don't think there's an ability to participate in online gaming without having going through that check. That would probably be a, a pretty big miss on behalf of the online operator. And I think with, you know, to answer the question with regard to a land-based casino, um, the problem is, is that in order to have a disclaimer, you, you have to have a contract. In order to have a contract, you know, you, you, can, you can do disclaimers with regard to people who join um, player, loyalty um, player loyalty clubs, but uh, somebody who hasn't, um, you know, unless you have some sign out front which says, you know, before you can enter this casino, you have to, you know, agree to these terms. Um, those disclaimers aren't going to work unless you put them into law. Um, which you can do. And, 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 and I think that really becomes the question um, that we're trying to answer here is, you know, do you create rights and obligations that will govern the casino environment with regard to biometrics and privacy through laws and regulations from, from the regulators, from the state legislature, or is this even the purview of, of gaming regulators because it's so uh, ubiquitous throughout society that it really should be handled on a broader on a broader basis? Yeah. I, I think that's an excellent point. And, and just listening to your comment just now, Tony, I thought that I think we're kind of here accidentally based on the history of gaming and the history of, of gaming regulation that we're at a position where, where someone like me and my counterparts in, in states and, and tribal authorities around the country can you know, at least try to control it and, and based on state law. But it, it's such a huge issue in society. One could make an argument that use of biometric information at casinos is important, but what about the use of biometric information and facial recognition for someone going into a library or a bookstore, and now they're going to now my preferences as to what kind of books that I buy is going to be tracked, or what 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 sections of the library or the bookstore I'm looking at. I think those have broader implications for society or, or for potential abuse beyond uh, what exists in a casino. And you know, Mark is exactly right about the the way that we've all been shoehorned now into buying tickets. Um, you know, trying to get rid of or acquire White Sox tickets or Cubs tickets here is, is a huge hassle. And now I feel like I've given up my everything that I had just to sit in and watch a, a baseball game. But, but you're right. I mean, to get to your other point, I mean, I think I'm not sure gaming is necessarily special. And if gaming is the one aspect where this technology is, is controlled or regulated, at some point it might be besides the fact if it's already been harvested and used and collected outside of the gaming industry. Correct. And that leads us into another question. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to combine two questions from the audience. Uh, uh, one with, with COVID-19, uh, once again on the rise, will more casinos turn to cashless gaming solutions through mobile devices? And then if that is the case, um, does that open up a whole new uh, area of data collection uh, that's being used by pretty much every other retailer in every other area of the economy? And kind of to the point you were making, Marcus, everybody else is doing this. Um, is, yeah. it, is it fair to, to, to tell casinos that it's out of bounds for them? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to defer to the other panelists when it comes to uh, uh, that issue as, as a, you know, that's something that, you know, yeah, I, I'm not going to offer a comment on, on that piece. I'm going to try and delicately step back, but you, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've got some personal thoughts around this. You know, we're, we're nine years removed from Nevada establishing the first set of online regulations. And it's pretty amazing what's happened in the last 24 to 36 months. Um, obviously, in 2011, we were dealing with a lot of unknowns and, and obviously concerned. We had a, a history as an industry of having strict regulation and and we didn't want to leap too far too fast and undermine um, you know, what were well-established norms. However, I would suggest that in the past 24 to 36 months, 
you know, the success that we've seen in New Jersey and now the onset of Pennsylvania and what will soon be Michigan and others, in addition to what happened with Daily Fantasy, I think it's, it's appropriate for us to rethink some of these things and, you know, things like cardless play or, or cashless play probably becomes a much more reasonable proposition than what it may have seemed 10 years ago, which obviously was, there was great concerns about and still concerns about, um, you know, play levels and, and people running up a credit card. But by the same token, you kind of take in context the policy in Nevada against online signup for mobile and compare with that to what's happening in the rest of the country. And it kind of feels like Nevada, we've fallen far behind with respect to, to mobile registration. So I think there's going to be these fits and starts with people becoming comfortable and, you know, COVID as a, as a, an event, you know, shine bright light on that and, and maybe creates a, a momentum that these things that we had been afraid of or, or concerned about are probably worth pursuing for good reason, because it's become a, a normal practice of patrons to transact with, you know, without cash. So. And, 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 and I agree entirely with what Mark is saying. Um, but I'll, in the casino environment, um, we have to be cognizant of the fact that people are becoming used to different types of electronic transfers in place of cash. Every year, the use of cash in retail establishments goes down and down and down. I think it's down to like 25% now. So that means 75% of all transactions outside the casino are being done through electronic transfers, whether they be uh, chip cards or mobile devices uh, using Apple Pay and things of that nature. If we as a casino industry think that we can put in what we want to put in and have the customers conform to what we think they should be using, we will fail. I agree with now, that. We have, to, we have to recognize that people are going to use what people use. And then we have to, once we accept that, then we have to build the protections around the use of those products for things that are unique to our industry, such as responsible gambling. But I think to do it the other way, to try to force them to utilize a particular method of payment in the casinos is the wrong approach. Well, and Tony, if I, if, you know, if I put my, my old regulator hat on, I mean, I'm dying for digital because some of my most important problems can be solved by digital payments. I mean, AML is much easier to track and enforce. Um, being able to give patrons tools to manage their behavior. You know, we fought off, I remember going back to the 90s, there was a wave of, of legislative efforts. In fact, I had to go to the, the National Conference of Legislators um, meeting to explain why banning ATMs from the casino floor was a bad idea because you were going to have patrons walking through dark parking lots with lots of cash and that wasn't a very good idea. And so we, 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 we they came up with this technology that you could put on the machines that allowed uh, on the ATM machines in the casino that allowed patrons to limit the amount they would withdraw. They could say, I can only use my debit card, but I can't use my credit card. That's where that whole wave of technology came from because they were trying to ban the ATMs from the casino floor. Well, if I look at moving from cash to digital, now I can give the patron total control over their experience. They can limit the, the amount of money they spend in, in, in any given day. They can track everything they're doing. They know what they spent on various games. There's just a, they can, they can self ban themselves for very specific periods of time. Um, allows me to, allows us to message to them to reinforce some of the thing, the messaging that we feel like they need to hear. Um, I just think as a regulatory tool, it's way more robust than having dirty anonymous cash for here around the casino that somebody sneezed on. I, I, I agree and I, I, think, I think that we need as an industry, and I'm going to go even a step further than, than um, saying that we need to remove the regulatory barriers to 
transformation to a cashless environment, I think the regulators and the state governments ought to be promoting the transfer from a, from a, from a cash base to a cashless environment in the casinos, specifically for not only the, pan the pandemic issues, but for the reasons that Kevin's talking about. Well, in that regard, Tony, just as a point of discussion, the cashless is you know, going back in time, been part of the licensing rubric. So the, the industry itself does itself a disservice because many of these large scales data uh, transaction processors um, just don't, don't see filing extensive applications and becoming gaming licensees as a, as a priority because the, the, you know, the, the non-gaming markets are so enormous that to be distracted by, you know, an intensive investigative review. So you know, that's an interesting question all by itself is do we hold, hold true to this requirement that if someone offers a cashless product, that that is the equivalent of a gaming license? And, and that's, a, that's an interesting question for me. Well, and, and I, I, think you have to, I think you have to distinguish between the, the, the cashless wagering system, which is the host system within the casino environment that you add to and subtract based on winner losses. Yeah. And the method of funding that right. system. And from, from, from the perspective of a regulator, you know, if we're requiring Apple Pay and Samsung Pay and Visa and MasterCard or payment processors to get licensed when they transact billions and billions of dollars in other environments, then I think we're doing a disservice to the industry and to the state. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm limited in what I can say about pro or, or con this, but I think that you guys have all perfectly hit the issues that that we as regulators struggle with in terms of there's obvious technological benefits. There are some other challenges that I think we need to overcome from a policy perspective and an implement, implementation perspective. And then as Tony pointed out, what are the safeguards and how do we put them in at the beginning so that we're not, we don't just open up and allow things to start being used without having a, a you know, a plan and thought about how it's being implemented. But I, I think at least for me, in my own opinion, I think to the extent that we can use technology and use technological advancements and developments to improve the industry that always improves regulations and the regulatory function. And so um, I'm, I'm very much in favor of that in a general perspective and then it figures out how do we apply that and what are the harms that we need to w watch out for. But I think it's important work and these kinds of conversations should continue because I think saying, well, that's hard and that's different than what we've done in the past, or this raises too many questions, so we're not going to think about it or focus on it. In my own, again, personal view, that's the wrong way to approach regulation. Well, we're running up against our time limit. There's a few more questions out here, but I'll forward these to the panelists and we can respond in writing. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, NAGRA, the North American Gaming Regulators Association, for working with this, us on this. Uh, I want to thank each of our panelists, um, for, the, for you, those of you who have coworkers or colleagues that wanna watch this later, it will be available on the GLI website for rebroad, re rebroadcast. Uh, we didn't get to the issue of uh, illegal and unregulated gambling and the types of technologies that are being used to circumvent the legal and regulatory uh, controls uh, throughout the US, uh, but that white paper is also available on the GLI website and uh, you can follow up with us. Uh, so, gentlemen, I appreciate it. It's it's uh, it's difficult to get the three of you in the same virtual room together, but uh, I think everybody benefited from your insights, and we, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you very much.